Blessings, friends, and hallelujah. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a lifestyle, and Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, Hallelujah. Now, we are continuing in our study of the seven churches on the book of Revelation. And today we find ourselves on the second church, which is the church of Smyrna. Now, before we get into today's study, I want to point out a couple of things that we missed on the last video. We had talked about the relevance and the order of the churches throughout the last 2,000 years and how they represent certain periods of time. I want to look at a couple of other things that I think that you might find interesting. First of all, Ephesus, as we learned, was the apostolic period. This was the period that the apostles that were sent by Jesus specifically formed the early church. And what's interesting is the word Ephesus means desirable. And so it is Jesus's desire to bring the body of believers together in what is a fellowship or later called a church. Smyrna, if you'll remember, was the time period of the Roman persecution. And of course, in the Roman persecution, many Christians were killed. And Smyrna actually comes from the word myrrh and represents death. And that's what Smyrna means, is death. Pergamus was the imperial time period under Constantine. And Pergamus means power. Thyatira was represented as the medieval times, specifically like the knights. And what we see under the Roman Catholic rule is over 50 million Christians killed because they will not convert to Catholicism. And this was known as the Inquisition. And what's interesting is the word Thyatira means sacrifice. And over 50 million Christians sacrificed their lives because they would not deny the teachings of the Bible and convert to the Roman Catholic rule. Sardis was the Reformed time period where we see many of the denominations arise. And the Reformation was all about exiting under the Roman Catholic rule. And the word Sardis means escape. Philadelphia, of course, was represented as the missionary time period when men and women began to spread out throughout the earth and take the gospel of the Lord Jesus to all the corners of the earth. And Philadelphia means brotherly love. What greater love than to take the message of the sweet Jesus to the world? And then finally, Laodicea was represented as the apostate time period, which we are now in. And Laodicea means to judge the people. And of course, those who are apostate or hypocrite bring judgment upon themselves. Now, if that's not interesting enough, if you've ever read these three chapters in its entirety, one thing that you're going to notice is that the heading of every letter to each of these seven churches, Jesus represents himself differently. For instance, in the book of Ephesus, he says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks represent the seven churches. So Jesus is in the midst of the seven churches as they are being birthed upon this earth. And what was the time period of Ephesus? The apostolic time period. So Jesus represents himself as the leader of the apostles as they go forth and build the early church. Unto Smyrna, he says, these things saith the first and the last which were dead and is alive. And as we mentioned, Smyrna is the time period of the Roman persecution. Smyrna means death and Jesus represents himself as dead but yet he returned to life. And these are comforting words for those who know that they may be dying soon for the cause of Jesus. Unto Pergamos, he says, these things saith he which has the sharp sword and two edges. Now Pergamos was the imperial time period under Constantine, who was a leader of armies. And Pergamos means power. And Jesus represents himself here as the general of God's army. To Thyatira, he says, These things saith the Son of God who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. Well, Thyatira represents the medieval times. It means sacrifice. And in verse 20, we're told, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because you suffer that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, brass in the Old Testament represents the sacrifice, and as Jesus represents himself in verse 18, a flame of fire. The sacrifice must be cooked on fire. To the church of Sardis in chapter 3, he says, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, 
and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. Now Sardis was the time period of the Reformation, leaving the rule of the Roman Catholic Church, because many of the things that it was teaching goes against Scripture, and so they returned to Scripture and lived according to the doctrine of God as opposed to the doctrine of men. But what's interesting is he says the seven spirits of God. Now, if you look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it says the spirit of the Lord, one, shall rest upon him. Speaking of the Messiah. The spirit of wisdom, two. The spirit of understanding, three. The spirit of counsel, four. The spirit of might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six. And the fear of the Lord, seven. And so many theologians believe that the seven spirits of God mentioned here and other places in the book of Revelation is referring to these seven spirits that we just read from Isaiah chapter 11. And so in understanding that Sardis means escape, how would one escape from false teaching? Well, he must be enlightened with wisdom. He must have understanding of the scriptures to be able to weigh between the difference of false teaching and true teaching. He must have counsel from the Holy Spirit might and courage to leave the false teaching and the false teacher. He must have knowledge. And of course, finally, he must fear the Lord, ultimately keeping God first in all things, regardless of how comforting the teachers of man are. To Philadelphia, he says in 3, seven, these things saith he that is holy, that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. God has opened opportunity to take the gospel into parts of the world that at one time were forbidden. And that's what Philadelphia means. It means brotherly love. It was the missionary time period. And so Jesus represents himself here as he who opens and no man can shut. He who shuts and no man can open. And last to Laodicea, he says, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And Laodicea is the apostate church, the hypocritical church, the false church, much of what we see today. And yet he says he is faithful and true. Well, what is the difference between falsehood? Truth. What is the opposite of mediocrity? Faithfulness. And so as you can see, within these three letters, there is so much meat contained, so many ways to interpret them. And yet what we have pointed out to you today and in the last video is too pinpointed to be circumstantial. But of course, that is all good for head knowledge. That's good for our intellect. But let's speak to our hearts and our souls today and see what he would tell us to the church of Smyrna. So if you have your Bible, open to Revelation chapter 2 and let's look at verse 8. He says, unto the angel, now remember, he has in his right hand seven stars or seven angels, and he walks amongst the seven candlesticks, which is the seven churches that we're studying. And so he says unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead, but praise God, he is alive. Friends, Buddha is in the grave. Krishna is in the grave. Muhammad is in the grave. But Jesus of Nazareth, hallelujah, he is alive and at the right hand of God. And he is moving in the lives of all of those who would surrender before him. The grave thought it could hold him, but hallelujah, he is alive. And when we face death and we take our last breath, life is waiting for us on the other side. Life as we've never known it before. And again, my heart says hallelujah, hallelujah. Now he continues in verse 9 by saying, I know thy works. Again, this is translated as obedience. Obedience to the things that I've commanded you. Specifically, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and Luke 6 and 7, what would be known as the Sermon on the Mount. And so he says, I know your works, your obedience to my commands, and I know your tribulation. Now remember, tribulation in the Greek is defined as a vice. So if you were to take a vice and put something in it and begin to turn the vice and squeeze, that pressure from the two sides would squeeze to a point of absolute destruction. And so what Jesus is telling us is he knows the pressures that we face, but it's the pressures of these life, the heat of those fires that refine us and make us the men and women of God that he intends for us to be. And keep in mind, Smyrna represents death. And so Jesus is saying, no matter how much suffering you go through, even to the point of death, this is what will prepare you to be my people. And what's interesting is if you look throughout the church's history, 
you'll discover that times of great persecution, annihilation, and death have not caused people to flee from the church, but it has actually caused them to run to the church. We are told historically that in the time of the Roman persecution, when so many of the Roman citizens saw the Christians dying in such devastating ways in the Roman Colosseum, and yet they did so with a smile on their face, joy in their hearts, and praises upon their lips, it caused these Roman citizens to sit back and say, I've never seen anything like that in my life. How can they die with such pleasure? Whatever they've got, I want it. And so although the Roman government was trying to extinguish the Christian faith, they actually helped create the Christian faith. And there were thousands that were coming to Christ every single day because of the way that these Christians were dying in the Roman Colosseum. Loving their persecutors, their tormentors, praying for them. As the lions rushed toward them to maul them, they were on their knees with their hands folded, praying for those people and to their God. And what you saw in these times of persecution, that those who called themselves Christians were really Christians because they knew they were facing a death sentence for being so. You wouldn't have found very many hypocrites or apostates in the church in that day. And the reason that we have so many false Christians in America is because the persecution has been non-existent. But when persecution falls upon this land and friends it will, you're going to see a separation between the wheat and the chaff, the sinner and the righteous. Because as we are so heavily persecuted for the name of Jesus, those hypocrites will flee as if their life depended on it. And interestingly, it will. He goes on by saying, I know your works or your obedience to my commandments. I know your tribulation, the suffering that you're going through in my name, your poverty, that you're not among the wealthy and the elite, but that you are poor and barely getting by. But then notice what it says in the parenthesis. You are rich. You're poor in the things of this world, but you are rich in spirit. Isn't that a contrast to what he tells us in verse 17 of chapter 3? Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You're rich to the things of this world, but you're poor in spirit. But unto Smyrna, he says, you are poor in the things of this world, but you are rich in spirit. I would prefer to be rich in spirit any day, friends. I would lose everything I own in order to have the riches of God's grace and Jesus' spirit in my life. He says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and they are not but they are of the synagogue of Satan. We could say it like this today. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Christians and are not, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. Now someone would say here, well, preacher, you don't have a right to judge others. Well, let me remind you, Jesus said you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. That's judging, friends. We have an entire book of the Bible called Judges. You don't think we're supposed to recognize and hold people accountable for taking the name of Jesus and yet living so evil and wicked? Of course we do. And anyone that would take that stand otherwise is a false Christian. Because a true Christian is looking for an opportunity to repent. They are looking for an opportunity to be more like Jesus. And anything in their life that's not like Jesus, they want out of the way. So Jesus says, I know you're suffering. Verse 10, fear none of those things which you will suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you will have tribulation 10 days. Now, theologians argue over what 10 days means here. I'm simply going to say it represents a short time period. You're not going to suffer long, but you are going to suffer. But hold on. Don't lose the faith. Don't give in. Stand upon the promises that your God has given you. And even if you face death, Know that there is nothing but reward on the other side. And that's what he says. Jesus says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. And he ends as he does every letter. He that hath an ear. Are you hearing, friend, the message of God today? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says 
says unto the churches, and we are the churches. It's not a building down the block. We are the houses of God. He resides within us. And so the Spirit is speaking to us for those that are listening. And he says, he that overcomes will not be hurt of the second death. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? There is no sting of death for the true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome it because it's the gateway into the eternal for us. And so friend, I'll end by saying this. We live in a time period here in America, Western culture, free society, where we have faced very little, if none, of persecution. But there is coming a time where we're going to face it. And when it comes, will you be ready? Will you remain faithful? If you're not practicing and involved in the disciplines of God today, you will not be faithful then. And what are the disciplines of God? Reading your Bible every day. As I've told you in the past, if you simply read four chapters a day, you'll read the entire New Testament once every two months. Eight chapters a day, every month you'll read the New Testament. And this is a practice that you should be disciplining yourself in. You should be involved in prayer, not just when you wake up in the morning and get down on your knees, not just when you go to bed at night and get down on your knees, but you should be in an attitude of prayer and fellowship and communion with God throughout the entire day. The door of your heart should always be open for the king of glory to enter in, to sit down, and to dine in fellowship with you. You should never be caught off guard. You should never be caught by surprise. You should always be ready to speak of the glorious things of God, and you should seek an opportunity to turn every conversation into a conversation about his sweet grace, his love, his mercy, and his compassion. You should be pondering and meditating upon the word of God. And you should always be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that lies within you. These are the Christian disciplines, friends, that prepare us and make us ready for the persecution to come. Well, I love you, friends. That brings us to an end of our study today. I trust that you have been challenged. I trust as these words have been spoken, you have been in an act of self-examination. I trust that your heart and your life are clean and spotless, allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work in you as he so desires. And I trust that you remain low and humble with a bowed knee before your God and King, serving him whom you belong to and establishing and building upon your relationship as you walk with him throughout this day, hand in hand, side by side. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I love you and I'll see you on the next video.